This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's long table, uh, Danny Zion, who is both an archaeologist and numismatist and well published in both areas. Uh, just check out uh, uh, Archer, the, uh, or not Archer, um, <laughs> blanking on the name of our library catalog, Donum, there we go. Uh, and you search his name and you'll find uh, quite a bit. Um, and for example, I have here, if you can see it, one of his recent books, which I have uh, highly recommend and have used quite a bit myself, Small Change in Hellenistic Roman Galilee, The Evidence from Numismatic Site Finds as a Tool for Historical Reconstruction. Um, he's also the head of the Scientific Assessment Branch of the Israel Antiquities Authority. So with that, we'll uh, pass it over to Danny to get us started. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a small correction, Nathan. I'm retired. I have been retired for a year, so I'm no longer head of anything except uh, my family, perhaps. Well, so. congratulations on your retirement then. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we can uh, turn on the lights. Can you all see the screen? Perfect. Yeah, oh, very good, okay. Now this is, uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, talk about a very interesting find in Akko. And considering not all of you know where Akko is, first of all, a map of Roman Palestine to show you the areas of, we are going to discuss, Judea, the main area, uh, Phoenicia, Galilee, the other areas will not really occupy us very much. This is Akko, this is the site I'm going to talk about. I presume most of you at least have heard about it or even visited it. And this is a closer look of the Galilee. This is Akko, the Akko Ptolemais, the town where the, the city where the port I'm about to talk about was found. And the three other red uh, entities will come into play later because there too, some uh, hoard, uh, hordes were found similar in some ways to the horde I'm going to talk about. But before, before we talk about the horde, an introduction to the site itself. The uh, horde was found in an excavation conducted in 2004 while constructing an underpass. This is the railroad that you see here, and this is the beginning of the underpass, and this is the excavation area. Uh, the excavation was directed by Dr. Yotam Tepper, who kindly uh, provided most of the photographs from the excavation. This is uh, going west towards the modern city of Akko and towards the old city of Akko, and in the Next slide, you'll see the uh, a plan of the area. This is the intersection that you saw in the previous photograph with the railroad and the road. This is the ancient Tel of Akko, which was inhabited from the early Bronze Age until uh, late in the Persian period, sometimes in the fourth century BC. From then on, the city moved westwards, uh, included all this area and also the present day old city here. And here in this area, we have numerous remains from the Roman period. We have parts of the Roman road that went from Antioch to, from, from Akko to Antioch and then further south. Hellenistic fortifications, traces of a Roman aqueduct, a monument. There is no question that the modern day roads here, this intersection, uh, was also a road in ancient times and certainly in the Roman period. And the excavation, in, in fact, uncovered a military cemetery. Akko was, became a Roman colony in 54 CE. There's a debate whether it was in the last year of uh, Claudius or the first year of Nero. The, this is not yet settled. But anyway, from the middle of the first century and until the second, third centuries, all this area was a cemetery. 
and we are we know the phenomenon of cemeteries built along the roads leading into and out of uh, ancient cities. The prime example in the city of Tyre in Lebanon where a massive ancient Roman cemetery uh, was excavated uh, years ago and it's still, it's still visible. So we have uh, the, the excavation uncovered the cemetery. Uh, the latest burial is the early fourth century. Afterwards, the area became covered by alluvial flows and it was an expanse of the marshland. You can see this is one of the latest burials with the coin. Of course, this photograph was doctored up a little bit after the coin was removed and then placed back. And uh, Haron's Obol, uh, I will discuss it briefly later. But in this case, this coin that was found right just on the lower jaw of the skeleton is very likely uh, Haron's Obol, uh, the, the tribute uh, dead had to pay to the ferryman to get across to the underworld. Now, what was found in this cemetery? Uh, just a minute, I cannot see the, the upper, okay, I can, cannot see the upper uh, topmost line of this uh, slide, but uh, I'm asking uh, the question in a roundabout way. Uh, how can we determine that this cemetery was not Jewish? Usually I would ask a positive question. In this case, I'm asking a negative question and why you will see in the following slide. But these are some of the finds uh, those who are familiar with the uh, Jewish burial customs or Jewish religion in general will know that in Jewish religion, we don't have uh, altars, we don't have figurines, we certainly don't have any animal offerings, nor any uh, 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 offerings that can be associated with, a, with, a, uh, uh, with pagan cults. Especially we, in Jewish burials in antiquity, we do not have any sort of grave markers of, of any kind. And why is this important to determine what this cemetery is not is coming up. Because in Israel, some of you may know, we have some ultra-Orthodox groups. And uh, one of their prime activities is to be opposed to any excavations of graves and tombs. And although, although we are in the city of Akko, which is not in the Jewish areas of ancient Palestine, we are in Phoenicia and we are in a Roman colony, uh, they were determined to stop the excavation and they vandalized it almost daily, uh, claiming that we are digging up Jewish burials. In fact, I still bear a scar on my thigh from one of those guys pushing me back into one of the trenches in the excavation. Because of this activity of these uh, fanatics, we couldn't do our job as we would have liked to. So some of the recording of the ongoing excavation was less than uh, desirable. But still, we found uh, many interesting uh, finds in this excavation. Uh, in fact, the underpass even today goes over the cemetery. We were not allowed to fully excavate it. And uh, the underpass is suitable only for private vehicles. Buses and trucks cannot pass and they have to make a three mile detour to go beyond that point. And now we are coming to the uh, burial itself. The burial contained about 16 skeletons of young males aged 20 to 30, stacked irregularly one on top of the other. You can see two of the skeletons here. Uh, we found some deliberately broken little clay bottles that we know it's part of a pagan ritual of, of uh, a morning, taking little bottles, breaking them ritually over the grave and throwing them inside. Uh, this is part of the hoard as it was uncovered. And here you can see the main component of the hoard, 37 silver tetragrams. And if you have good eyes, you might spot one, two, 
three, four, and there were seven more coins dispersed very close to the main uh, hoard. It was found lying, you cannot see it in this picture, but it was found lying right on the thigh bone of the uppermost skeleton in the uh, burial. And of course, uh, first thing we want to know the composition of the hoard. So we have altogether 44 coins in the hoard and two extra coins, which I found uh, with a metal detector on the surface. So I, we are not sure if they belong to the hoard or not. So I added them here in parentheses. So we have five coins of Nero, 14 plus one of the Spatian, two of Nerva, 22 of Trajan, and one plus one of Adrian all from the mint of Antioch, all tetradrams. Many of them are in very good condition. Some of them are worn. And contrary to what we would expect that the older coins would be the most worn, this was not always the case. Some of the coins of Nero were in a pretty good shape. And some of the coins of Trajan were in a very poor state of preservation. Uh, the date of the hoard. The latest coins are Hadrian, and uh, these tetradrams minted in Antioch carry a Greek version of a Latin legend that appears on the coins minted contemporaneously in Rome. And we know that this legend in the, on the coins of Rome uh, appeared only up to 124 CE. Another clue that we have is the coins carry the uh, third consulship of, of, uh, of Hadrian, which was awarded in 119, but it was his last consulship. But strangely, uh, Hadrian kept the third consulship on his coins immobilized uh, through the end of his reign. So what we can tell about the date of the hoard is the latest coin was minted somewhere between 119 and 124. And it was buried, the hoard was buried not before 119, but probably not much later. The coins are in pretty good state. I cannot say two years, three years, four years later, but certainly not very much later. So much for the hoard what we can say so far about the burial. Uh, it's a mass grave with very uniform skeletons like all young males between 20 and 30. So we think the burial is related to a single event. Uh, the buried are most likely soldiers. We are in a Roman colony in the early second century. We found some definite uh, burials of soldiers. We found some cremations, which are not very commonly found in, in Israel, but we did find a couple in this uh, cemetery. So they are most likely soldiers. Uh, we can say that the event, whatever was the event that caused the death of those soldiers took place not long after 119. Was it a battle? We don't know because of the uh, conditions we excavated in, the bones could not be analyzed for marks of violence. We had to, after they, we excavated them, we had to hand them in to the Ministry of Religion and they buried them somewhere and we don't even know where. So we could not, we did not have the time to analyze them. Uh, the only two military events to speak about that, uh, that happened in the early second century in uh, Judea Palestine was the uh, revolt of the what we call the diaspora revol revolt that took place around in the days of Trajan around 110. It was well over by the time this board was buried. The otherwise other one was the second Jewish revolt also known as the Bar Kokhba revolt uh, that took place in 132. And we shall come back to this uh, in a minute, to this possibility. Uh, 
or maybe it was something else. And I will discuss the possibilities. Of course, when we study Horde, we study its, uh, its makeup, we study its date, and we try to find some parallels and try to understand what were the circumstances that uh, caused this uh, Horde to be buried. Uh, what we usually do, we make comparisons to other hordes. And here, uh, in fact, I uh, take some work that was conducted by my very good colleague and friend, Gabriela Bichowski, who works for the Israel Antiquities Authority uh, coin department. Some of you certainly know her. She, in fact, worked, worked at the ANS for a period when she was uh, helping write the uh, very important volume on the coins of the Holy Land. Uh, and she, in fact, studied a large number of hordes in Judea, uh, all from the same period, and all connected to the second Jewish revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt. And let's see what she came up with. She studied, I think, close to 10 hordes. So I'm taking, in fact, only the gist of her uh, work, in which she summarizes five uh, criteria that she found common to all uh, the hordes that she studied. One was that the hordes that she studied contained both Roman imperial coins and provincial coins. The second was that the hordes contained silver coins of emperors who had ruled 50 to 80 years before the deposition of the hordes. Most coins in those hordes were of Trajan, and those of Trajans included also drams and tridrags minted in Bostra, the capital of Arabia that was created in uh, the, the Roman province that was created in 106. And finally, the number of coins of Hadrian were the latest, and the number of those coins were small and date no later than the outbreak of the Second Jewish Revolt. Uh, here I call him Ben Kuzba. Now, it, Popularly, you all know him as Bar Kosva, but in fact, we now know from Tapiri that were found in the Judean desert that his actual name was Ben Kuzba. So I'm here so jumping into deep water and calling him by his actual name, but you will know that I am referring to what you know as Bar Kosva revolt. Uh, if we compare our horde in Akko, it fits in three of the parameters. It, did, it contained only uh, imperial tetradrams, and it did not have any uh, tridraftsmen or drams minted in Bosnia, but otherwise it contained early coins of Nero. Most of the coins were of Trajan, and we had only one or possibly two coins of Hadrian. So in this respect, our hoard in Akko uh, fits very well the profile of the coin hoards that uh, uh, Gabriela Bichowski determined were part or related to the events of the Second Revolt in Judea. Now, if we look at map of Judea and the map of the revolt, uh, we can see the uh, a plan of the uh, a map of, of uh, Judea and the extent of the revolt. The blue, the outer circle, is the initial extent of the revolt. Then as the Romans pressed in, it uh, uh, receded until finally in 135, the rebellion was uh, quelled uh, completely. In fact, today there are even more discoveries uh, around Judea, so we can now push the limits of the rebellion a bit further north. And in fact, apart from very minor uh, uh, mentions of mentions of this revolt in written sources. The, practically all that we know about this revolt comes from archaeology, and they include hiding complexes that the Jews uh, quarried in uh, preparation of the revolt, uh, single coins and hordes in all this area, and those are what Gabi Wichowski studied. Uh, I couldn't resist to bring you just one example of three hordes that were found in one single cave in Judea. Just a really amazing find. 
This has been published. I'm sure many of you have seen the publication by Boazisu and his colleagues. Uh, one hoard included the three, three, three metals, one incredible hoard of Bar Kokhba coins. I know uh, some of the collectors online, their mouths are watering looking at this hoard. And another interesting hoard that included coins of the first Jewish revolt and the coins of the second Jewish revolt and Roman uh, denarii and tetradrams. So really a really fantastic find. Uh, the question arises, can we connect our hoard in Akko to those hoards in Judea that were no doubt related to the second Jewish revolt? Now here again, I ride on work that my colleague uh, Gabriela Duchowski did because she published the coin finds from a very important excavation that took place here at Vadi Hamam. It's very close to the shores of the Sea of Galilee. At this site, two hordes, not one, two hordes were found. One was the, the horde called the Burnt House Horde and the other the Burnt, burnt Room Horde, all definitely uh, emergency hordes. And when she wrote up the uh, report for Vadi Hamam, she of course tackled the question of what are those hordes doing there? And can they be also related to the Bar Kokhba rebellion? And while doing so, she used our horde. This horde was, as you have seen, was discovered or, already in 2004. And she got my permission to uh, quote the details long before we, we got around publishing it. And uh, let's see what her, uh, uh, what her conclusions were. If we make, these are the five criteria that we've seen before. And these are five hordes that were found in Galilee. And this is again from work that Gabriela Bichowski did. For the first criterion, only the one of the hordes at uh, the site she studied fits the bill. Second criterion works perfectly in all the hordes found in Galilee. Third criterion works partly. And uh, the fourth, again, partly. And last uh, criterion, uh, the numbers that you see here are the dates that, of the latest coins in those hordes. In for, uh, of course, in silver coins, the uh, 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 dates of the latest coins are of the latest possible minting. There are no, no actual dates on the coins, so it's uh, conjectural. Here we have a bronze coins dated to 125, so here the date is much stronger. So uh, in conclusion, Gabi Bichowski thought that because the, this hoard at uh, Vadi Hamam fits all the criteria that she had determined for Judea, she came to the conclusion that uh, this horde or this site suffered in the second rebellion and that this was a very good indication that Galilee also took part in the second rebellion. And uh, here are ways part because I don't agree with her at least not fully. And now I will bring my own considerations why uh, this isn't so. These are photographs of the two hordes, the burnt house horde and the burnt room horde. This again, you can see it's a mixed horde of silver and bronze coins, provincial issues, imperial issues. The smaller horde was uh, uh, much more, uh, uh, much, much smaller. Uh, uh, there is no question that some uh, violent event caused the house to be burned, uh, but I do not think it was uh, related to the second rebellion. Uh, let's look uh, uh, why not. If we look at these hordes, uh, I agree, as I said, I concede that the Vadi Hamam horde is an uh, the two both hordes are emergency hordes but these are the only ones known from the Galilee in this period. And I am not sure that you can build a conclusion on a single horde 
after decades of excavating Galilee, this would, would be the only sort of circumstantial evidence uh, relating to the uh, second revolt. If we look at another parameter, the Akko horde, I do not think it's an emergency horde. It cannot be completely ruled out, but I think that a uh, horde that is composed solely of imperial tetragrams uh, wow. cannot be considered an emergency horde. It's more probably, I think it's probably salary that was paid out to Roman soldiers. The Tiberius Horde, which consisted also of only silver tetragrams, uh, I, again, I do not think it's an emergency horde. And the final horde that uh, uh, Bichowski studied is very uncertain. It, it contained only 13 coins. It was found in the dump. Probably it's, a lot of it is still missing. And uh, we don't really know it, uh, the circumstances of its burial. And finally, uh, Akko is not in the Jewish settlement area. So there's absolutely no reason that any event of the Bar Kochva revolt uh, would be played out in Akko Ptolemais. And this site, Shara Amakim, which is, in, I, you, you will see it in the map again, it's just about on the boundary, so there is a very slight chance that it is in the Jewish uh, settlement area, but I would think not. And finally, not a single Bar Kochba coin is known so far from Galilee, not a single one. Uh, so uh, let's look at other possible causes. I think I made my at least I believe that uh, I made a clear case for not considering the hoard as having been deposited as part of any events related to the second revolt in Galilee, because so far I don't think there is any solid evidence of anything happening in Galilee uh, during this revolt. So what other possibilities do we have for the context of the hoard from Arco? Uh, the custom of Karen's Obol, I'm not sure it's applicable because it's a hoard of 44 silver coins. That's not what you would expect. Uh, the Karen's Obol is usually single coins placed either in the mouth or over the eyes of the uh, deceased. And this is not uh, what we have here. Uh, I have to give uh, credit to, to colleagues in Europe who sent me tons and tons of papers relating to uh, burials that contained coins all over Europe. And I haven't been able to find a single one that is even remotely similar to the one I have. So uh, we can quite safely say that it's not a Karen's Obol. Uh, we have quite a numerous examples in Europe and in Israel of burials that contained hordes in them, but single burials. We have anything from the classical Greek uh, period all the way to the uh, uh, Middle Ages. And we know of quite a few mass burials, not so much in Israel, but all over Europe. They are known. Mass burials are known for poor people who couldn't afford ordinary burials in battlegrounds and for plague victims but none that I could find were found with coins. So, so far, our hoard from Akko is unique in that it's a mass burial and there is a hoard inside. I do not know of any other mass burial that had anything similar. If any of you has known anything about anything that I missed, I will be more than happy to learn. So what's the story? And uh, this story does not have a happy end because I don't really know. But I have three tentative suggestions, none of which is foolproof, and I will give you the pros and the cons of each. Uh, we know that soldiers, Roman soldiers, while they were not fighting, had to be engaged in various activities, uh, not the least to keep them busy and tired so there is no you know, uh, brawls in the bar and uh, things like that. 
And we know that much of what they did was constructing fortifications, constructing roads, uh, doing agricultural works, uh, digging ditches, whatever. So one scenario, possible scenario is that what the mass burial is an accident. Those uh, young guys, those young soldiers were engaged in some sort of work and something that could well fit the bill in the early second century is a massive uh, operation of road construction that took place under Trajan and including the very famous Villa, uh, Via Nova Traiana and a whole network of Roman roads connecting the major uh, cities and the major uh, Roman uh, camps uh, within uh, uh, Palestine, uh, Roman Palestine. So that is one possible story that could have happened with that mass burial. In this scenario, the hoard is a burial gift by the comrades in arms. And many of you will probably uh, say, no, 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 that's not very, very uh, logical. And uh, the reservation is, this is a radically generous gift. That's uh, several months wages for a soldier. And I strongly doubt that those colleagues would chip in uh, and uh, donate all uh, 44 tetragrams for that burial. So this scenario has some merits, but well, I think we can discard it. Uh, second scenario, which is in fact the first one I thought of when I was at the site, is an epidemic. Those guys, there was an epidemic, those guys died and uh, people buried them uh, in their clothes to avoid being, uh, being uh, avoid contagion, catching the disease, whatever it was. So that, uh, that horde was on, in the clothes of the soldier and was somehow missed. And we have examples of burials in Europe. I have here a very gruesome picture from Italy, uh, a, a burial from the second, third century. These corpses were buried with their clothes on and lime was thrown over them. Quite, quite certainly a, a, a sign of an epidemic. People were died in an epidemic and were buried quickly with the clothes on with some disinfectant poured over them. What's the problem with this scenario? Is that if this was the case, we would have found some other small finds, maybe some other soldiers carried something in their pockets. And uh, we, have no, any, we have no information whatsoever about any epidemic at this time in the country or anywhere nearby. So again, this is a possibility, but uh, I cannot say if it's right or wrong. Uh, the third and last possibility that it is totally unrelated to the burial and was deposited later. And I know of some examples like that in Europe where people came to the graveyard and for whatever reason uh, deposited, uh, buried a hoard in a, in a, in a grave. Uh, one, uh, something I can think of that a thief stole this from someone and went to find a place to bury. Uh, reservation, uh, the site is on the main road. As I showed you early in the earlier pictures, the cemetery was right on the main road, getting into or out of Akko, very close to the road itself. So if I was to bury a horde clandestinely in the in, at night, I wouldn't go there because it's right on the road that I could be seen. And the coins were found directly on the bones of the uppermost soldier. I didn't mention this, but I told you that some of the coins were dispersed. So we figured that they were in a sort, sort of a purse and as the, the bodies decomposed and some void was created, some of the coins found their way down and uh, dispersed. So in fact, this is the uh, unhappy end of my story because I don't really know what happened and uh, I'm open to suggestions. Thank you for listening. And if we, if you want to conduct a discussion, I'm willing to hear you. <clears throat> Thank you, Danny, for that uh, excellent and very interesting talk. And we appreciate you taking the time to 
give one of our ANS long tables. Uh, it was a great one. Uh, I'd like to ask if anyone has questions or comments for Danny or any thoughts on what else this uh, could be. In any case, if any of you would like the, uh, the uh, uh, juicy details, this hoard has already been published. So if you drop me a line, I, I can all send you a PDF of the article with a little more details. In a, in, a, in a presentation like this, I cannot go into all the smaller details, but they are all in the, in the publication. Um, where is it? Gary? So, um, here we go. A question, um, is it possible, kind of seems really stupid to kill 20 or 30, um, how, many, how many corpses were there? How many bones? 16 people, 16 young men. Okay. Um, does that divide into anything, Danny, that's part of a, a cohort or a work group? Could they have been killed as punishment for something that Theft, never, 44 never, points okay that never occurred to me i admit uh, i'm not really familiar with the uh, divisions of the roman army i know they had a centurion which is a hundred people and uh, the curion was that of 10 people so i guess the divisions were 10 100 etc mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so 16 doesn't seem to work and I doubt I'm not uh, really that familiar with the uh, with the uh, Roman army. Uh, it was a capital punishment uh, part of the, of the deal in the Roman army. With the, Isn't with that the, the why why we get the word decimate? Yeah. Ah. Oh, okay. No. Okay. 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 So Actually, uh, uh, it was eight, not ten, and eight was a contubernium. Eight soldiers would uh, share a tent or a living quarter. So 16 would be two contubernia. Well, yeah, so I mean, it's possible that it, it could be related to two contubernia. Okay, I'm learning something new, but it still doesn't explain the, the presence of the horde. No. No. Um, <laughs> Would it be possible, I mean, here we go, Miss Marple, I'm not, but um, what if those two tenths worth of soldiers ate something that was um, actually fatal to them, food poisoning that was really poisoning, and they, it was uh, mysterious and they just buried them all together? Okay, that's another scenario. We can add it as scenario D for sure. Yes. Okay. The appendix. Yeah, 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 the appendix, right. Okay. That's why I'm so sorry that we could not analyze the bones yes. for, for uh, marks of violence, which is routinely done. But in this case, because of those vandals, we couldn't do that. But so I, I didn't understand you gave them to a uh, council for religious burial or something you said? Yes, that's mandatory, unfortunately. We are not free to excavate graves. We have to either do it clandestinely and at night or get special permission, which is seldom granted. And we, if we do come across bones, it, they have to be handed in to this group who then goes and buries them. Something I didn't mention, we had sort of uh, uh, we brought a very religious uh, professor of archaeology, Professor David Adan Bayevich. Some of you may, heard his, may have heard his name, uh, for a, as an arbitrator. And he came, he saw, and he said, there is not a chance that in Akko Ptolemais in the early second century, a Jew would be buried in this Roman cemetery. And as soon as that was his verdict, the ultra-Orthodox group did not accept it and kept on coming and done oh. it. Such difficult circumstances. I'm sorry, because it kept <laughs> us knowing history. Yeah. In fact, even, even when we uh, find burials from the Chalcolytic periods long before Abraham, they still maintain that they, the 
there is a chance that one of them was a Jew. So I see. We are stuck. But could, we, could when as you excavated, could you note if there were like broken bones or broken skulls or? Uh, we could have. The point is, I personally was not there the day the bones were excavated. I came every other day, more or less. Uh, so I cannot say, but I know I was told that on the day that the bones were taken out, they did it in such a hurry that apart from uh, determining the number of the skeletons and their general age group, nothing else could have could be done. Oh, that's too bad. Well, life needs mystery, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, if any of you thought drop me on. This is great, Danny. Let's have dinner sometime. <laughs> yeah, <good. laughs> okay. Okay. I accept that. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.